Okay, everything you need to know about 1984 Chapter 5. Chapter 5 takes place during Winston's lunch in the cafeteria at the basement of the Ministry of Truth with the nasty smelling stew and the victory gin available if he wanted to buy it. So I guess you could drink during your lunch hour. A co-worker named Syme comes up to Winston um, while he's waiting in line. Syme works on the 11th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary and Syme asks him if he has any razor blades. Winston lies because he only has two left and there haven't been any available for months. So apparently, I guess there's always a shortage of one thing or another. The Ministry of Plenty's job isn't to make sure there's actually plenty of everything, but to report that there's plenty of everything. So Syme makes some small talk about the hangings the other day that Winston didn't go to and talks about how he loves to see people's legs kick when they're being hung and their blue tongues shoot out of their mouth. So whenever Winston talks to him, he tries to get him to talk about news speak so he doesn't have to go into other topics. He gets the pinkish gray stew and swings by to get some gin before they sit down together. Winston just knows that Syme doesn't really like him. Winston gips, uh, gulps down the horrible gin and then he eats his food because all of a sudden he realizes he's hungry. And he notices someone behind him that's talking in a way that sounds like a quacking duck. And we'll get back to that in a minute. So Winston asks Syme about the Newspeak Dictionary and gets him going. He kind of revs him up. And Syme shares that they're destroying words like crazy and that the new edition of the dictionary will only have words that are not going to be obsolete by 2050. So he explains that they're getting rid of synonyms and antonyms. Uh, and they, as an example, he says, if you only have good, you don't need bad. You can just say ungood instead of bad. So you get rid of bad. If you want better than good, you can just say plus good. Uh, so any shade of good or bad is going to end up being only six words with the word good at the root of all of them. So... Of course, Syme credits Big Brother with the idea, which they give all credit to Big Brother. Syme criticizes Winston for not really getting this about Newspeak. That he reads Winston's articles and sees that Winston just kind of substitutes some Newspeak words without really seeing the beauty of what Newspeak does. Syme confides that the point of Newspeak is to limit people being able to think. He thinks that thought crime, when you think things against the orthodoxy of the party... Um, well, he thinks thought crime is going to be impossible because there's not going to be any words to express it. Syme thinks there's no excuse for thought crime even now, that people just have to be self-disciplined and that by 2050, uh, thought is going to be so limited that no one would even understand their current conversation. Vocabulary is going to be so narrowed down. Winston wants to say, except for the proles, meaning the poor lower class workers, but he stops short from actually saying it, but Syme figures out what he was going to say and just basically says the proles are non-humans. Syme predicts how everything will change and that not even the party slogans are going to exist in the same form. Because how can you say freedom is slavery when there's no concept of freedom? He believes that thinking won't even exist in the same form that it does even now. Winston again focuses on the man that's quacking behind him. Apparently, this is an example of duck speak, which is like a mindless barking out of party propaganda without really thinking. Syme is the one who defines it as duck speak for Winston, that when you hear duck speak that's agreeing with somebody, that it's supportive, and that duck speak against someone and an opponent, it's supposed to be abusive. So basically, the man was quacking out orthodox approval of Big Brother. And Winston is certain that Syme will disappear, that he's going to be vaporized, because Syme while he's totally passionate and supportive about everything about Ingsoc, he's just a little too smart and a little too insightful about things and says stuff that shouldn't be said. Winston basically notes that being passionate about the party is not enough. You basically have to have a blind stupidity as well. So to Winston, orthodoxy is unconsciousness. That's a quote. Orthodoxy, if you're not familiar with the term, means that you conform to the authorized beliefs and practices in a system, and in this case, it's a political system. Syme notices that Winston's big, doofy neighbor Parsons is walking up to sit with them. Parsons is basically described as an overweight, horribly sweaty, and smelly moron. Parsons is tracking down Winston for a donation for hate week party favors. We're told about 25% of people's salaries are to be given towards these voluntary contributions, 
Parsons also apologizes for his son hitting Winston in the back of the head with the, the catapult the day before. And then he tells the story of how his daughter and two friends ditched this organized hike on Saturday and followed a strange man because he looked suspicious for like two hours before reporting him to the police. So while they're talking, the trumpet sounds from the telescreen with an announcement from the Ministry of Plenty. They just sit and listen, and the announcer says that there's there's celebrations and uh, gratitude thanking Big Brother for raising chocolate rations to 20 grams a week. Now, Winston cannot believe that people are going to actually buy this because he knows that the chocolate ration went from 30 down to 20 just yesterday. And that there's no way people would believe that it went up to 20 as like this generous gesture from Big Brother. But he is shocked that everyone around him just believes this, even though he knows it's a total fabrication. It's a lie. And while he's sitting there, the, the telescreen just keeps throwing out amazing statistics about how everything has gotten better than the year before. So reflecting on life, Winston was sure everything was miserable. Everything's low quality and everything's always in short supply. He feels inside that the human being is being cheated, that this is not how um, life is supposed to be. This uncomfortable, miserable existence isn't supposed to be this way. I mean, looking around, he reflects, even everyone is ugly. That scurrying, weasel-like people uh, are the type that flourish under this brutal control of the party. After the announcements, Parsons asks Winston for a razor blade, but Winston tells him he's out as well. He starts thinking about who he knows that's going to get vaporized and who wouldn't? When he catches the girl with dark long hair looking at him, she looks away when they make eye contact. Winston gets super nervous that even though she might not be thought police, she could be worse like a trigger-happy amateur spy just looking to report somebody. So he believes he might not have been monitoring his face very good and could have committed what he calls face crime, where you don't have the right expression for what's happening around you. He thinks she might be the thought police, and he would be in prison within three days if she was. Parsons interrupts with another story about how his kid set this pro woman on fire in the marketplace for wrapping up sausage in a poster of Big Brother, and thinks they're awesome. The whistle blows, and they return to work. So a basic point of this chapter is to illustrate another area of control the party is attempting to develop and implement, this time by controlling language and thought. By limiting human expression and communication, the party can further strengthen its control over personal freedom. So like Syme says, there, if, if there's no words for feelings of rebellion or criticism, it's much harder to rebel or criticize. Really, it seems like the more you can swallow and repeat the propaganda of Big Brother, the more orthodox you are and the better your chances of survival. The party observes and monitors every physical part of your life with telescreens, thought police, spies, and language manipulation is a way to get control over one's mind and thoughts as well. It's interesting when I hear people say they don't mind public surveillance because they have nothing to hide. Having nothing to hide misses the point of having privacy and personal freedom. Whether or not you have something to hide really depends on the values and goals of who's in charge or who's in control. It's also interesting to note the barriers between people that are evident in this chapter. Nobody likes each other, and everyone is distrustful of each other. You always have to consider how you say something and what you say, and how people are going to perceive that, never knowing if they're going to report you or have any hint that you might be turning away or disloyal to the party. That could cost you your life. The party does not want connections between people, so friendship is a thing of the past. Distrust is supposed to make them turn towards more loyalty and trust to Big Brother and therefore the party. So I hope this was helpful for this chapter.